perform a few test cases, uh, test scenarios. So we started with the Tuttle Estate subdivision, which would be the farthest north, north subdivision on, on Meadow Lane. Um, we had completed baseline traffic studies before any, any of the improvements were constructed out there, and that gave us an idea of what the, uh, the number of vehicles that travel there on a daily basis and also the average speed the vehicles were traveling. Within the complete streets policy, there were multiple measures that were considered for traffic calming. Uh, they ranged from curb extensions, raised uh, pedestrian crosswalks, additional striping, uh, traffic circles, signage, and shared lanes. With the geometry limitations along Meadow Lane, some of these traffic calming measures might not be appropriate. So to start out, we actually started out with a traffic calming island and also a chicane. The chicane and the, the, the uh, traffic calming island are both uh, physical, what would be physical obstructions in the roadway meant to, meant to slow people down and also, and also get their attention. Uh, we did also install permanent pavement markings at the entrance to all of the subdivisions along uh, Meadow Lane where they intersect arterial roadways such as 127th, 135th, and 143rd Street. We will continue with additional pavement markings on uh, Lockport, on Meadow Lane at Lockport Street now that uh, IDOT has completed most of their road work at that intersection. But um, we, did, we did complete the pavement markings and we, we did, uh, you'll see later in the presentation here, we did notice a little bit of, uh, we did notice a speed reduction in Tuttle Estates. Uh, we don't know if it's directly attributed to the pavement markings or some of the other measures we did, we did up there. So one of, the, uh, one of the other measures we did up in Tuttle Estates was a temporary traffic circle, which shown, uh, what's shown now is a permanent, what would be a permanent traffic circle, which would be a uh, concrete curb and gutter circle with uh, some nice landscaping inside, uh, low, main, low maintenance and uh, low growth, so it would remain, um, sight, lines would, sight lines would remain. Um, like I said, this is what a conceptual proposed traffic circle would look like. The, uh, the next slide here shows the actual traffic circle that was, temporary traffic circle that was installed. This was uh, done with some yellow delineators. Uh, these, these are similar to the permanent delinea delineators we have on 135th Street at Route 59. Uh, this temporary traffic circle was in approximately a month, and this was in during, during the school year. So we did see a lot of school traffic and also buses navigating around this traffic circle. With this traffic circle, we saw a reduction in speed uh, depending on what leg of the intersection you were at of between three and six miles an hour. So um, we, I have a, a summary slide at the end, but um, we, we did see a reduction in speed with a temporary traffic circle. The other traffic calming measure we did install in Tuttle Estates were the curb extensions, and this was done at the at an existing four-way intersection. This was at the intersection of Meadow Lane and Pavilion Place. Uh, the, the main goal of installing the curb extensions at this intersection was to bring some more visibility to the stop sign. We did have a lot of resident concerns about cars either not stopping at the stop sign completely or missing it altogether. So uh, the goal of this wasn't, um, wasn't necessarily to reduce speed, but to, to really provide more visibility for the actual four-way stop sign. Uh, but we did see a speed reduction in uh, the approach legs to the intersection of, of up to two miles an hour. It wasn't consistent on all the legs, but uh, one or two of the legs did show a reduction in speed. And once again, this is a, this is a photo of the actual temporary installation showing the yellow delineators at uh, at all four corners. Um, I, I should note, I should have mentioned this before, but Public Works uh, staff did, did install these traffic calming measures. So as we, uh, as we get into next year, we do have these delineators in our garage so we can, we can pull these out next year and reuse them. So 
So as I had mentioned before, uh, we did see speed reductions out there for really all the, all the traffic calming measures we did consider out there. Um, the biggest, the biz, biggest reduction in speed or largest reduction in speed that we saw was uh, northbound Meadow Lane, which, would, which was uh, north of Pastoral Drive. Uh, before we did anything out there, the average speed was approximately 31 miles an hour. Once we did have the traffic calming measures in place, we saw this average speed reduced to 25 miles an hour. Uh, that, that was the largest reduction in speed. So that it, with the traffic, in the vicinity of the traffic circle, the speeds are reduced between three and six miles an hour. And then as you look uh, on the bottom of the sheet, that would be farther south near, uh, that would be a Pavilion Place and Pastoral, or Pavilion Place and Meadow. We saw a reduction in speed, uh, depending on what leg of the intersection you're at, of approximately two miles an hour. One thing to remember with, with the traffic studies is when we do a traffic study, we, we generally do a 24-hour study. So it's really a, a snapshot in time. Uh, it's always possible if we did the study one day earlier in the week or one day later in the week, we might have slightly different results. Um, but um, they, are, they are average speeds and you know, average vehicles per day. Um, this year we're going, this upcoming summer, we're going to evaluate Meadow Lane on, on a monthly basis uh, if we can acquire additional traffic counters. So as I mentioned, the, the uh, temporary traffic circle was, uh, we did see a speed reduction of three to six miles an hour. If, uh, if we do it says if the village board decides to move forward with a permanent traffic signal at this, in, at, this, uh, per, at this location, I would recommend eliminating the stop signs on the two legs of the intersection. Generally, uh, it, with the other traffic circles we have in town, they are uncontrolled so that the cars basically yield when they're coming into the intersection. And to be consistent with the other traffic circles, I would make, I would make this one similar or recommend to have it signed similarly. And the other, the uh, temporary curb extensions, uh, we did see a speed reduction there. Uh, but with, um, with the cost of installing the temporary curb ex extensions, they may be better served at a location where we have more pedestrian traffic, uh, such as near a school. Uh, there is uh, a school down in Liberty Grove that we will be evaluating temporary traffic calming measures this upcoming year. So then we can see if we see a similar or if not greater um, reduction in speed or um, at least we can, uh, we can determine from the students out there walking and their parents if cars are actually adhering to the stop sign condition. Um, while the temporary traffic circles were in place, we did, we did receive some feedback from residents out there. Uh, it was fairly limited, but mo most of the most of the comments could probably be summarized that the people, they, they weren't in favor of the traffic circle. It wasn't necessarily the traffic circle itself. It was the aesthetics of it. Uh, if we did do a permanent, permanent installation out there, it, it would be similar to the slide I had shown earlier with the uh, landscaping. Um, other, other residents did mention that they didn't feel there was a speeding problem to begin with out there, and they didn't, they didn't know why we were installing the temporary measures. So moving forward in 2016, we're going to uh, continue with placement of temporary measures a farther south on Meadow Lane. This will include Walker's Grove, Prairie Knoll, Dayfield, Liberty Grove, and the Whispering Creek subdivisions. Um, the Liberty Grove and Whispering Creek subdivisions uh, couldn't be completed this year due to the traffic signal going in at, in at Lockport and Meadow Lane. So that, that's why we waited on, on those and then to get an accurate uh, an accurate idea of the effective effectiveness of the traffic counters in Tuttle Estates. We did um, decide to wait on the Walkers Grove and Prairie Knoll traffic calming measures. So, in addition to the placement of the temporary traffic calming measures, we'll continue to evaluate the new traffic pattern at uh, Meadow and Lockport Street due to the traffic signal. As I mentioned, we'll perform monthly studies along Meadow Lane with and without temporary traffic measures. And then lastly, uh, 
We'll continue with the integration of complete streets on other, other projects within the village. That includes our resurfacing and uh, capital improvements. One of the recent projects we have brought before the board was the 127th Street reconstruction project. And with that, we are integrating a shared use path into that project, uh, as well as a, uh, at least one or two uh, crossings across 127th Street. So um, with that, um, be happy to answer any questions. I had a general question, Scott. It might not be something that you would expect uh, <laughs> for us to ask tonight. Maybe another staff member may have the answer. Uh, the permanent um, traffic circle as illustrated on page 7. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, does any staff member have a, a rough estimate on a conservative cost of something like that? Obviously, without like a fancy fountain or a gold-plated Village of Plainfield sign, just something very basic. Preliminarily, we have looked at rough costs for uh, traffic calming measures such as that, and it's probably in the fifty thousand dollar range. Um, it 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 is quite costly, but it's a, it, it, it it yeah it, it does seem to be effective from what we've seen. All right, thank you very much. I, I know you made mention that you were looking to add or review further south in Walkers and Liberty Grove as well. Was there any thought about uh, the location where you chose the first one at Pastoro instead of, it seems like it's getting value, so why not maybe move it further into the subdivisions to maybe increase that value longer? In other words, it's almost really the last, what, stop sign, almost the last cross street before you hit 127th, correct? Yep, I believe Pastoral is this, uh, I believe there's one more street north of uh, Pastoral before you get to 127th Street. But um, this this upcoming year, we will be evaluating other measures, which would include a temporary traffic circle in, in the Walkers Grove subdivision. Well, the Pastoral, if I remember correctly, was chosen because of the east-west connection that ties into some of the other subdivisions and the... And yeah. the, and Do the Vehicles per day, uh, Pastoral does handle a large, larger amount of large amount of traffic, um, so that that is one reason why we had chosen Pastoral, and just working north to south, it, it made sense. And in Tuttle Estates, that was the best place to to evaluate a traffic circle. In in Walker's Grove, uh, preliminarily we were actually looking at at Sunderland. It's a little bit different. We we see elevated speeds in that area near Sunderland and Meadow Lane. But that is a that's a um, three-way intersection there, so it is a little bit different than any other traffic. Would it would be different than any other traffic circle within the village? But um, it, it can still be evaluated. Do you have counts on Meadow through Tuttle when you did yes. this analysis? Yes. Do you we know do what have, we do have the traffic counts. I I don't have the vehicle per day counts with me, but we do have them. I'd like to say that six miles an hour is not insignificant when there are children in the neighborhood and the stopping distance of a potential vehicle. And then the question bouncing off of Trustee Peck's comments on the, uh, the cost of it, are there any more or other aesthetically pleasing varieties of temporary structures that you can put in the summer? I mean, I'm assuming this is all to slow the speeds down during the, the summer when the children are out. Maybe not as much during the winter when the snowplows need to go through. Yeah, and, and that's one of the main main reasons we we are not continuing the stud studies during the winter is because of the uh, the snow plow and and they don't uh, the snow plows generally don't play nicely with the right. the plastic delineators. Is there anything out there that's uh, marketed that is um, better looking than the yellow pylons? Or have there, we looked? Yeah, there there may be other options out there. Uh, one of the advantages of the yellow pylons is is their visibility, um, but that is also. A, a disadvantage, uh, you know. At least we've we've heard that from some of the residents out there regarding the aesthetics. But that is something we can look into. And how many um, residents have you heard from? Because this seems to be an ongoing thing for us. As I know, I've heard from many residents, and I'm sure some of the other trustees have as well. Is it something that we want to pursue asking more questions, or we should we not ask more questions? During I mean, the during the study when we had the. Uh, the uh, temporary traffic calming measures were out for approximately a month. And we probably heard from 10 to 12 residents during that time. Um, and and you know, probably 8 to 10 were regarding the aesthetics. Um, before we did install these, and I, I didn't mention it, and I, and I really should have, 
we did send a letter to uh, we did send a letter to each resident that lives along Meadow Lane within the vicinity of the traffic calming measures to let them know they were going in and also we did provide our contact information if they did have uh, concerns about them thank you the uh, comments that you received though uh, Scott where you heard from residents that they didn't think they were needed most of those if I remember correctly came from residents that don't live on Meadow Lane correct correct they, they the, those most of those comments came from residents that live on what would, what would be the side streets on, of Meadow Lane were there any comments favorable or unfavorable uh, that you noticed from the residents that lived on Meadow Lane the Meadow Lane comments were mainly I, I'd say negative in nature related to the aesthetics I I, I, I one one positive one does jump to mind um, that I know I know one person was very happy with the installation of them out there I live within sight of it um, I live on Meadow Lane and uh, the aesthetics are not very pleasing but six miles an hour is a lot to slow down and it's noticeable From my perspective I think is an extremely well done study you're thorough you're got concrete results from the things that you're trying to do you installed traffic calming devices they actually slowed the traffic down you got some documentation of that there's no variability every place it actually reduced it some either two three six miles per hour and I agree with Judge Wojowski that's uh, six miles an hour is a big thing uh, I wouldn't worry too much about the aesthetics I think we need to be more concerned about safety and speed is relates directly to safety in an area that's that residential and it's got a lot of kids at least I assume so I don't live there so I think it has a lot of children so I think it's very well done um, I would recommend you go ahead with the program that you're talking about and implementing it I'd like to see us actually do that because Meadow Lane has been an issue for I don't know six seven years speeding down there we've here talked about it this is the first time we've got concrete numbers and a thorough study well documented study that says we need to go ahead so I would certainly support uh, going ahead with it and spending money as needed to uh, implement it I think that's important uh, you did raise the question of the uh, curb extensions making the stop signs more visible did that you check to see if that had any impact anybody I mean you wouldn't obviously don't have the data from because you've got speed data but yeah Anybody yeah, that's, visually. Uh, that's a little bit more subjective regarding the, the visibility of the stop signs but uh, at least at the uh, location of pavilion and and meadow I think there's some I think there's some additional things we can do with signing them with signing itself it, advanced uh, you know stop sign ahead signs um, that may be uh, well they definitely be more caught it'd be more cost effective than than putting in the curb extensions there um, and, and maybe where we if, if we are going to install curb extensions uh, somewhere it's in an area that gets more pedestrian traffic that would make sense uh, that people will respect pedestrians if there's a logical crossing a lot of the streets probably don't have that many pedestrians but near a school you certainly would so that might be more effective so uh, the other thing I would consider since we're talking about resurfacing Pilcher next year I would highly recommend that we go through this kind of uh, analysis with the residents along Pilcher and see what kind of uh, what we can do to slow things down there uh, you got a you got a nice uh, grab bag of uh, options and I think uh, well, let's see what works yeah staff is currently coming up with uh, different options for for Pilcher Road right now okay, great that you make my life a lot simpler if you do <laughs> I appreciate that I think CN wants to put a spur down there so it should <laughs> slow it down <laughs> 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 I have a, a question this might be just too basic but as I'm looking at your numbers here and so it looks like a lot of the average speed was about four miles over this the posted of 25 uh, some 27 some 29 would it, it would maybe this is just too easy would it be does it work in other words if you change the speed limit so if people are averaging three to five miles over what if you change it to 20 are they still gonna average three to five over and now we're really at the level we want them to be yeah, we uh, uh, speed limits are, are generally set uh, based on what's called the 85th percentile speed, which is what 80, basically what 85 percent of the uh, motoring public would be traveling, and um, 
generally for speed limits to be effective, they need to be within five miles an hour of that range. Um, and generally, the average speed is, it's not the same as 85th percentile speed, but it, it's in the same ballpark. So um, it, lowering the speed to 20 miles an hour probably would have a yeah, negligible the, effect. The road profile largely drives that, right? Right, as, uh, and yeah, that. And, I, I just wonder if there's not some human nature part of it. So in other words, if people feel comfortable, you know, going five miles over the speed limit and not having to end up with a ticket or something, then, you know, if that's 25, then I'm okay. I'm going to feel comfortable doing 30. If it's 20, I'm going to feel comfortable doing 25. I don't know. But it's not a bad thought what you're uh, getting at, but I know that, uh, and this happened before I got here, but um, uh, Van Dyke Road was one of those roads that we had stated as a 35-mile-an-hour uh, road, and the the road profile calls for it to be a f it, it, well, it depends on where you're located but as much as a 45 mile an hour road and uh, mm -hmm. people were using it as a 45 mile an hour road even though it was posted at 35 so it's a question of making sure that your road profiles match what your preferred outcome is which is part of the reason why we have this uh, meadow lane issue is it's a little bit wider so that's why you you, you get a little bit elevated uh, speed uh, it's a good question that you asked. I mean, I just look at, I know there's a neighboring community of ours that's Normantown Road, I think it is, and it's a four-lane road, and yet you go through there, and I think the speed limit's 25 miles an hour, which to you, I think the, you know, you look at it, and you're like, trying to do 25 on a four-lane road is very difficult <laughs> to go that slow. I don't know how effective it is from a policing standpoint. I don't know, but are you familiar with that section? No, I'll have to go take a look. I think it's Normantown Road. It's the one that's just east of Weber, goes towards the uh, school, and and then it drops back to two lanes. Okay, that's uh, that's a faster track in the morning than maybe you went through because I traveled it this morning. But isn't it posted really low? Uh, there's that school that's posted as you get closer to 53, but the other one is uh, I think it's 35. But the cars are definitely not doing 35. The Lakelands did have their posted speed limit of 20, and we have our own streets. And if the chief remembers, uh, I think you were involved, or maybe it was Chief Bennett. But uh, we were told you couldn't, you would not enforce it at 20 because IDOT or universal road rules say residential areas are 25, and you could enforce 25, but you could not enforce 20. That's correct. And again, as uh, as was mentioned, uh, it, it's all based on the the uh, ge geography of the road. Uh, the formulas that are put together through the manual of uniform traffic uh, control devices and um, the, the uh, as Brian mentioned the the profile of the road as well that's how the the speed limits are determined yes you don't enforce 20 anywhere do you? Uh, at school in school zones we do well, school zones where lights are flashing uh, yeah in school zones yep. I have one minor question for you Scott uh, you said the lights are delayed. Do we have any timetable for the meadow and 126? I, I had spoken to IDOT last week, and and they had they were hopeful it was going to be in the next couple of weeks. I did not have uh, an exact <coughs> date. Uh, what I was told was the the actual signals themselves are going to be the um, black powder coated signals, and they were being painted. So that that's what I was told the holdup was. Yes, uh, one minor comment. Uh, you know, uh, Mr. Three, what you had to uh, chart a very uh, narrow course with this particular program. There's an old saying, uh, you do something right, no one remembers. You do something wrong, no one forgets. Uh, in this particular situation, uh, you know, I, I look at your mission statement for the complete streets policy, and uh, what everyone wants, they want calm streets, but they don't want any distraction. They want safe streets, but they don't want any distraction. Uh, you, uh, you know, a, a question was asked, did you reach out to the community? I felt your program was uh, throughout the entire summer when you were at the car shows and uh, the mailings. It was an open program. If anyone wanted to uh, be able to offer a suggestion to you, they could have done so. So uh, I don't think you have to answer any uh, criticism on that particular fashion. I think you did a great job with this. And like I say, the mission statement is uh, completely done. And uh, what it will do is bring calmness 
and safety to streets. I spoke with a number of residents on uh, South Meadow, and they were very disturbed over the years about people in the morning speeding through, speeding through, speeding through. We have to stop that because it's dangerous, and uh, this entire program, I think, is a, a, a real step in the positive direction. Thank you for your work. Well, I, I do appreciate that, but uh, it is a group effort. Uh, the planning department also um, helps spearhead this, so it, it is a, a group effort between uh, a few departments here in public works, or in, in the village, I should say. No, I'm, I'm glad you uh, said it's a complete effort. Obviously, I uh, overlooked the fact you were the, the leader in the particular thing, and I think you could disseminate uh, the positive remarks made by this board to your team because they do great work. Thank you. Thank you. So next steps for next year, we'll continue doing the temporary measures. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. But comment, Administrator Murphy, what kind of a timeline, if there's consensus of the board to make some of these temporary structures more permanent, um, I agree with uh, what uh, Trustee Wojo had said about seeing such a reduction in speed, it only may be a few miles per hour, but that does drastically in increase the, or decrease the stopping distance. Uh, in a residential neighborhood with children. So if something, for example, as I put on page seven, you said was about $50,000, we had said it was about $50,000. What, what steps and what kind of a timeline does staff need with board direction to say, you know what, let's make um, option A, C, and J permanent instead of temporary? What, what, what do we need to make some of that move forward? Yes, sir, that's um, a very good question. <clears throat> what I think we'll continue do, to do is um, test those temporary measures out at uh, other <coughs> the other locations as uh, Mr. Threewitt had identified in this coming year. And as we go forward in programming for this upcoming uh, budget year, we'll take a look at what measures we can accomplish within the uh, capital budget. Um, as was mentioned, um, the traffic circle seems to have a, a pretty decent effect. The concerns were of those aesthetic nature. Uh, there are some permanent uh, uh, examples in some residential neighborhoods in, in Naperville, for example. So we get a chance to take a look at how some of those are uh, designed and installed for, for those aesthetic purposes. And we'll work uh, to in include those in with our capital budget, uh, our street budget that we have coming up. Um, Mr. Threewood and uh, Mr. Jessen uh, have, uh, have identified, as you know, about $2 million worth of road work to do. So while $50,000 seems like a lot of money, uh, it might be something that we can uh, indeed program in within uh, within a, a time frame. However, at the same time, they'll probably want to time those projects in with when we're doing some street resurfacing within that area so that it's, uh, it's a little bit more um, programmed out. Excellent. Thank you very much. Just one other quick question. On the, one of the pictures shows a green bike lane. Any idea how much it costs to do that per mile, half mile? Off the top of my head, off the top of my head, I, I do not. Uh, Might be worth checking. I, it, driving into Evanston periodically, I notice they have uh, a bike lane that's green. They also have little markers to indicate that, and it makes it a whole lot safer. And it, when you get into the Pilcher Road one, uh, one of the issues there, we have markings there, but the markings eventually fade, whereas a green paint may not, or it may actually convince people that that's not a regular car lane. So if it's not too expensive, it's at least, at least find out the cost of that. So maybe throw it in the equation for Pilcher studies. So. That can be done, and I know the City of Chicago Department of Transportation uses the uh, green bike lane markings as well. Okay. Interesting to see what costs. I have no idea either. But, uh. Next item on the agenda is 2016-2017 fiscal year budget. Thank you very much. Uh, tonight we're going to talk about the water and sewer division and um, believe it or not, we are nearing the end of our series and presentations on the different sections of the budget after this evening. Uh, there will be several opportunities for the board to make comments, uh, the public to make comments too as well, to evaluate the draft document too as well. There's public hearing uh, before the adoption of the budget and as Tracy's nodding her head, we still have <laughs> Uh, plenty of time, but typically uh, after the first of the year, the draft budget is ready for the public to review and make comments to as well. Um, so tonight's uh, actually the last, I think the last presentation later today. So tonight is as much an update about where we're at with water and sewer division and um, 
basically what's been accomplished. Uh, kind of looking at it from a, a business and uh, part, uh, part and parcel and uh, where we're headed here in the future. So I'll go through the slides very briefly and then uh, I'll be happy to answer any questions uh, that the board may have. So first of all, in our mission statement, and this is the same for streets uh, as well as the engineering division, I won't read it word for word, but I will tell you that it, its core is serving our community uh, to the best of our ability, providing the highest level of service that we can while protecting our employees at the same time and providing them opportunities for advancement uh, within the organization. So with the next slide. Over the past several years, our population has grown. This is akin to uh, the chief's uh, presentation about uh, officers and just the growth of the community. Overall, you know, the population has grown significantly from 2006 where we were about 7,000 people to about 40,000 people here as far as residents are concerned. Our employee to staff ratio has gone from approximately two and a half employees uh, per thousand residents down to 0.8 employees per thousand residents today within Public Works. And there are a number of different reasons for that. I'll go into it just briefly in the, in the following slides. Um, but some of those things have to do with technology. It's not just uh, cutting back to save money or things like that too as well. So with that to the next slide. Um, this is a similar slide that you've seen within the Street Department Division too as, as well, or presentation as well. Um, in, two in 1996, we had 18 full-time employees within Public Works. Uh, that was when we had about two and a half employees per thousand residents. As of today, we have 32 full-time employees within Public Works, and you can see the change. Um, we kind of rode the wave with the economy, but when the economy did uh, taper back a little bit, well, we followed that too as well. We, uh, we cut back and we were fiscally responsible because um, the revenue wasn't coming in the way it was before. By the same token, there were some areas where we weren't installing as many uh, nearly as many new water meters. We weren't doing as many inspections as we had in, pa in the past. There w just wasn't the workload that was created during that 2005, 6, 7, 8 time. And we adjusted accordingly. Um, so from 2009 to 2015, our workforce in public works uh, was reduced by 25% and uh, actually 30% in the water and sewer division. Now tonight I'll preface that we're not asking for any new employees within water and sewer. I know Mr. Kissel and Mr. Stofko just sighed back there behind me, I heard it. Um, but um, we hope at some point in the future, as the village continues to grow, um, the fund gets more healthy and the need uh, is there too for additional uh, people in the workforce that that is in the future here. As far as the organizational chart is concerned, uh, there are 10 employees within the water and sewer division. There's one adjustment in here. The wastewater maintenance uh, worker actually works within building maintenance and takes care of the buildings at the wastewater facility. So uh, half of that individual's time is spent uh, within public works overall and not specifically at the wastewater facility. So you truly have the water superintendent and four employees and the wastewater superintendent and floor, four employees to uh, operate the entire division. And they do an outstanding job. Part of the cost savings related to uh, public works as a whole was before we built the public works facility, we were actually operating out of three different buildings. And that really presented a problem with sharing equipment, finding things that were needed, parts and things like that, organizing crews, sharing employees and things like that. So a little over 10 years ago when the public works facility was completed, it actually created a great deal of efficiencies within the department. Departments could share employees, they could share equipment, um, they had a good handle on where things were at. So there, that was, there was actually a great cost savings to bring it, everything under one roof. And now we also have the building department within that same facility and that does add some efficiencies as well where it creates better communications between the building department um, where we can move, uh, move more efficiently on projects too as well. So there is great cost savings there. The Lake Water Station, um, huge cost savings in electricity and we don't really go back far enough in this budget to show uh, some of those things because when you, you really have to look back at the tenure um, and then you have to factor in the changes in costs for electricity. So it's a little tricky to do that. But the Lake Water Facility with the advanced technology um, the way it provides water to what we consider to be the high zone 
and the lower zone within the community. That means everyone gets generally the same pressure. It doesn't mean that there's higher pressure in one part of the community or others. But since there's a grade difference in the community of about 100 feet from the north side of the community to the south side of the community, we have to take that into consideration. And there are two different zones. There are actually three different zones, um, which one is co controlled computer, uh, computer controlled, and it's very advanced. But all these things help add efficiencies. What was interesting is when we had the last Chinese delegation out and they visited the station, they had asked how many people actually work in the Lake Water Station. And at first I was a little puzzled and I said, well, there's one employee that comes in in the morning. And they said that, and the employee stays all day and another employee comes in at night. I said, no, there's one employee that comes in in the morning and stays for about an hour to make sure that everything's operational because this is interconnected to our computer SCADA system. Um, the employees can have access, make changes, there are alarms and things like that. It's highly, highly automated, and that does help save money in labor too as well. So we save money in labor, we save money in electricity, and on top of that, there's additional capacity for the growth, commercial growth, industrial growth, and residential growth too as well. The wastewater treatment facility is also one of the highest tech uh, wastewater facilities uh, within our region and within the state of Illinois too as well, and we're very proud of that. Um, it does uh, take uh, some labor to keep it running, but there again, you know, five employees to operate this entire facility, um, over 200 miles of uh, wastewater uh, mains out there, uh, sewer lines, and then 17 pumping stations out there. Um, it's amazing that these individuals, the low number of individuals can take care of all these things. And it's really uh, based on their abilities uh, that have been learned and, and, ha and have been trained to take care of these things and also the technology that's built within the facility too as well. So I have to give both the superintendents credit for encouraging their employees um, because they're more than just water and wastewater operators. They are technicians um, and they are very experienced and they do a great job at keeping things running. So the wastewater plan is great, great amenity. The next slide, um, you'd be surprised at uh, the number of communities that I come in contact with that either are not uh, doing radio reads as far as uh, water meters are concerned or they're just starting into the process and uh, I get calls on a regular basis as to how does this work how do I begin what's the best thing to do and you know I have to bite my tongue I think we're going on about 15 or 16 years that we've embraced this technology and utilized it um, it took us a while to become fully automated but that was a little over 10 years ago and it's worked out very very well one employee can read all the water meters within the community in less than a day. So if you think about that, the readings automatically download here at the Village Hall. Um, there's very little labor that's involved in creating and generating the uh, water billing process too as well. So that saves the village money. As far as our employees, we have four Class A uh, EPA certified water managers. Um, that means that they have the qualifications based from the state of Illinois to uh, operate any size water treatment facility. So the, you could have uh, one of these four employees be in charge of the water filtration plant in the city of Chicago, which would be the largest, one of the largest filtration plants in the world. Uh, we have three class one wastewater operators, which is the highest level that you can receive on that side. Um, so the, high, the largest wastewater facility in the state one of our three employees would be qualified to manage that facility too as well. So um, that's pretty remarkable because most communities don't have that layer of uh, management where we have that understanding as to how to operate these complex uh, processes. So I have to credit the employees. If we talk a little bit about water production, we'll switch gears a little bit. And since this slide was so busy here, I did provide a copy, and I provided a copy to the audience members too as well, so it's not just the board. We'll be happy to, uh, I'd rather do it after we get through December so we get the final numbers for the year, but I'd be happy to post this on the website too as well. This is our uh, water production over the past seven or eight years and did provide a copy to the board. And it just shows where we're at as far as uh, the amount of water that's been produced and provided treated and provided for the community. Um, and it's really interesting to look at. We uh, track these things very carefully because it does, it is akin to water sales. 
Now we pay for every gallon that comes through the pipeline. So if people conserve water, we pay less for water and then we charge less for water. So it, there is a, uh, a relationship there too as well. So, um, but with that, if you look back and I have on the slide here, we'll leave it on that slide. In 2007, we had the highest ever water pumpage for a given year. And that was a little over 1.2, uh, almost 1.3 billion gallons for a year. We had 8% water loss that year, and that's important when you look at some of the other numbers. In 2012, it was the second highest year that we ever had at 1.2, almost the same number, um, billion gallons uh, of water at 2% water loss. So in actuality, uh, when you factor in the water loss, there was more water that was sold in 2000 per gallon, sold in 2012. Um, and that was after the economy kind of tapered off. So it, it's really based on the usage at the time. It was a hotter, drier year and things like that. 2008 was the third highest. That was in the kind of the other side of the boom, but there were still some newer lawns. 2013 was the fourth highest, um, another hot, dry year too as well, at 2% water loss. And interestingly enough, and we're confident, even if we come in with a very average number, that this year, this past year, will be the fifth highest year ever. And it's interesting because this is, has been one of the wettest and one of the coolest summers that we've had. And you can see that in the summer numbers are lower than average, but our winter numbers are higher than average. And it, it indicates the growth of the community that we are getting more users, we're getting more co commercial users, industrial users, even on the residential side too is more, more users. So it shows a very strong, um, although uh, managed growth, let's put it that way. Um, and it's always interesting to see some of these peaks, especially in 2012, to have uh, a couple of days at 160, 170 uh, thousand or million gallons is uh, really impressive. Um, but it, and it shows the ability for us to provide water, quite a bit of capacity too as well. So Jonathan, if you wanna move on. Uh, water that we provide for the community, uh, it's uh, basically a uh, penny. Um, it's 1.2 pennies uh, for every gallon of water uh, for the average user, and I get a little depiction there. But that's not only for water, that's also for wastewater. That's also to cover our debt service, capital costs too as well. Um, so that's for the entire thing, is a little over a penny a gallon. Our average household will use about $2.52 worth of water and sewer services per day. Our minimum household user will spend about 73 cents per day uh, per household for water and sewer service too as well. Uh, we do have some new information this year. IDNR completed, the Illinois Department of Natural Resources completed a water rate survey um, now keep in mind before I talk about this a little bit, just to give you an idea, usually IDNR completes a survey every 10 years, but they decided to do one at 2015 to get a better gauge um, since the city of Chicago has increased rates significantly over the past four years. How has this impacted the other communities um, that receive Lake Michigan water? Keep in mind that people in the state of Illinois that receive Lake Michigan water are in the neighborhood of about 6.5 million people in the Chicago land area. Now they're just under 3 million people in the city of Chicago. So the majority of the Lake Michigan water actually is provided to the suburbs in some way, shape or form. And Evanston has their own system. So there's a little mix in there too as well. But even if you take in account all of that information and take all the communities, over 170 communities within the Chicagoland area are on Lake Michigan water, that um, their, their research and their study indicates, and you can turn to the very last page after the budget report, and I don't mean to jump all over the place, um, but Plainfield's rate right now is $7.78 per thousand gallons the average rate for the over 170 communities within the sh whole Chicago land area came in at $7.97 per thousand gallons. And that actually placed Plainfield 2.4% um, below the average of all of the rates for all of the other communities within the Chicago land re region. Now, this is, I think it's an important fact 
to know, but by the same token, keep in mind that that doesn't take into account for the most part any fixed charges like meter charges, fire uh, system charges, capital charges, things like that. This was strictly the rate. But you'll find rates that are all over the board, well over $10, $1,000, $5, 1000 And it really does vary depending on uh, the community. But again, it doesn't take into account the capital charge or the meter charge or the fire system charge too as well. That would be a more comprehensive study, but IDNR doesn't typically go to that level. I will say that to say this, if you look at the 2010 average rate of $5.22, the rate on average in five years for all of the Lake Michigan water communities has increased by over 50%. So there has been quite an increase in the area, but by the same token, we are at the end of the pipeline. I mean, we are the furthest away from the uh, Giardine water filtration plant, uh, but we're still very close to the average for the area. So I, I think it's something that the community should be proud of, that um, we're not that far off and that the, uh, the budget is very healthy too as well. So with that, we'll move on to the next uh, slide. Projections for uh, water distribution or water wholesale purchase costs. These are not the costs that we charge our residents. These are the costs that we incur uh, from the city of Chicago um, and then through the uh, uh, lake water pipeline, uh, the American lake water pipeline. As you can see, there was a significant increase from 2008 uh, through the daily administration. There were some significant bumps over a three year period. And then through the Emanuel administration, there was actually a five-year planned increase rates which were implemented. We are now into the period as of 2000, 1st of 2016. The rate is supposed to remain uh, consistent with the producer's price index, um, which that number will come out later too as well, but we expect it to be uh, close to CPI too as well. Uh, it may be higher than that. I'm getting the signal It'll probably be higher than that. Um, but still much more manageable than the 24, 25% increase that we had one year and then the 15, 15, and 15, or 15, 15, and 14, um, which were some significant increases. Now, I say that you think about the city of Chicago, the residents of the city of Chicago had to incur that increase too as well. Um, that this went to the Supreme Court at one time, the city of Chicago cannot charge more for people outside of the city of Chicago, then they can charge their own residents. That's already been through the court system. So when they increase the rates, they have to increase the rates for the residents as well as people outside of the city. But since we're further out, we do pay uh, some additional uh, funds to get the water transferred to the city uh, through the pipeline, basically. In the past 10 years, the average increase for wholesale water purchase costs has been 6%. Due to our growth and some of our adjustments in the tougher times in the economy, our residential rate over the last 10 years has only increased 3% per year on average. That's water and sewer um, too, as well as a whole. So on the positive side, um, our improved bond rating uh, continues to save us money for our residents as the refinancing of the, of the debt here over the last couple of the years and the, and the better rates as far as the bonds are concerned are a very positive thing. Um, so the residents see that in the savings and the rate, which is uh, outstanding. The water and wastewater systems are well in compliance with the EPA regulations. Uh, we're very pleased with that. The water quality is excellent. We get a lot of, so, still several comments as to how great quality, uh, what the great quality of Lake Michigan water is like and not having to soften water and all those things too as well. We have additional capacity for future growth that's built into both systems, the water and wastewater system. The water loss continues at an all-time low of 2%, um, and I have to thank Mr. Stavko and his, his team related to that. They continue to work on this. Uh, we completed a water leak uh, survey. We continue, last year we change out meters. Um, they fix main breaks in a timely fashion, um, and they're still well below 2%. And uh, interestingly enough, water conservation over the past 10 years, our residents use 12% less water per household than they did 10 years ago. So even with this water conservation, now we shower heads, toilets, um, even the washing machines, I think are probably one of the biggest advances in saving water too as well. Our residents are using 12% less water 
And on this chart here, we're still pumping just about the same that we did over the past five, six years, which is really a good testament to the fact that the village continues to be healthy and continues to grow too as well. On the last, next to the last side, slide that I have for the future, we have a few things. The Route 30 reconstruction will continue to bring uh, opportunities for replacing water and uh, wastewater lines. Um, I'm happy to report that it was less than a month ago. Uh, they did complete the crossing of Route 30 with a large diameter water and sanitary sewer main uh, to service the boulevards, uh, the boulevards property there, future uh, commercial redevelopment area uh, at that location. There will be an upgrade at the lift station. There'll be some new pumps and new pumping equipment too as well at that location to take on some additional capacity. We did make our payment to the state. They accepted our check. That was interesting. <laughs> um, they accepted our check. They cashed it right away too as well. <laughs> um, they accepted our check. So we paid our half of our proportionate share. This is mainly for the utilities. We'll be billed for the remaining half probably two to three years out in, in the future. And you'll see that reflected on the capital side that we don't have much money budgeted for Route 30 South, I'm gonna call it, because we did pay our proportionate share for some of the work that's already been done and some of the work that's gonna be done here in the near future. And we will be billed a couple of years down the road. Route 30 North, which in, a, in essence is um, that area that's near Diageo, near tower number two we call it it's out in the um out near route 30 and along route 30 to the north in the kusikowski area it's an older water main uh, we'd like to increase the size and replace that we did include some engineering money last year and even some construction money um, that should be uh out to bid here shortly in the early part of the year and there is funding in there for the for the construction of that um, and then we have some money for some routine maintenance, uh, which is a little more intense. We have some larger pumps that need to be replaced at the wastewater treatment plant that we're gonna bid out uh, that were part of the original, uh, exp the original construction of the plant. Um, they're gonna be bid out shortly. And then also as far as equipment is concerned, uh, we have a utility truck that has a crane on the truck. And this was a perfect piece of equipment when we bought it approximately 14 years ago. Since then, the pumps have gotten larger um, and that in some areas, it's even more challenging to lift the pumps. So the department has requested, Mr. Kissel has requested uh, that we replace that truck with a larger truck with a larger crane that can lift the new pumps at the wastewater treatment facility. And then also back to Route 30 is an awkward area and they are gonna be some large pumps over there to take that entire region um, to be able to lift those pumps too as well. So there'll be a request for that piece of equipment along with the replacement of a pickup truck. But that in essence, um, and lastly, part of our revenue to take care of offset some of our debt service does come from uh, sales tax, that's not uncommon in communities. Um, I know that ultimately at some point we would, like internally we would like to grow out of that at some point. We don't see that in the near term, but at some point uh, that that would be a good plan for the future uh, as we continue to grow, to grow out of that too as well. But just to recognize uh, for the residents out there that we're doing everything we can, uh, and I know the mayor and board to keep the rate as low as possible. Part of that is offsetting the debt service with some of the sales tax money too as well. So lastly, we have the sheet with all the numbers and then we have the, uh, the information that was provided in the packet. So with that, I'll turn this over to questions or Tracy, if you want, you have some closing. Sure. Sure, I can speak, I can speak um, briefly on the budget that you have in your, in your packet and primarily on the summary page is where you're going to see most of my um, conversations moving towards the, the budget between the current that we're in in fiscal 16 to the proposed in 17 is just under a 4% increase. It's actually 3.8%, $600,000. And relatively speaking, um, you're looking mostly at contractual services increasing primarily because of um, the cost of, of water to um, per gallon that we're paying as a village. Now keep in mind that the revenue offsets um, slightly with the contractual services line and it's an estimate at the beginning of the year. Um, and so the 8.6 million, that includes water and sewer, I mean, um, the 8.6 million includes the water charge that we have estimated and some smaller contractual services in the detail that you'll see. 
Um, but again, historically, you can see where we've, um, under contractual services, where the village has ended up at the end of the year. But seeing the trends that we're having so far, um, staff was comfortable where we had our projections to date for fiscal 17. You will also notice on the expense side that the transfer number has increased. Um, and that transfer number is a transfer directly to debt service. Um, this, uh, the village is, has a level def debt service um, payment that happens throughout all of our debts that we have for the village. And so what happens when a bond issue has been paid off, something will offset and c continue to keep level debt service across the whole village expenditure. So the 970000 that's increased on the transfer, there's a reduction within, I believe, our capital fund of debt service that needs to be paid from that fund. Um, this has been, this is the way it's programmed. This is the way that um, all our debt service has been covered historically. Um, it's been something that staff has looked at and we've been realizing that this was coming um, into this year. So it's not a surprise in any way, shape, or form. I just wanted to bring that to your attention in case you had a question what that transfer was directly related to. And the reason that it transfers to debt service is because a portion of the debt that they're paying off is funded from other sources. So it's only a portion of water and sewer that's covering that 970000 You can notice right below it, as Alan mentioned, the capital expenditures that um, staff is looking to propose for this next fiscal year has been reduced significantly from the current. Primarily, again, it's the Route 30 expansion, which we will not need to expend for another probably one to two years, if not longer. If you recall, in the Route 59 expansion, when we did that, it was a number of years before the state actually invoiced our final payment that we needed to make. So. We're well aware of it. In actuality, we're going to reserve those funds in the background on the staff level and as part of the audit. But from a budgetary perspective, it's not something that will need to be expended for next fiscal year. All the other, other revenue sources seem to be relatively consistent. Um, surprisingly, our, our sales tax, which is the state of Illinois taxes, um, has been consistent throughout historically throughout the past three years. Um, I would have anticipated a slightly slight higher increase from year to year. It's just not happening on the home rule sales tax side. So uh, we felt internally that we should keep that number relatively consistent with the current fiscal year. So there's not a huge change between 16 and 17. From a staffing perspective, no new hires. Um, we've had a couple changes within the staffing. So you'll see some of those numbers actually flat because benefit um, decisions on the employee level they may be a single employee coming in where there was a family employee prior. So, so we're seeing very stable numbers on our salary and benefits numbers for this fund as well. So with that, that's my overall summary. I'd be happy to go through any of the detail within the pages of the water and sewer fund and answer any other questions that you might have. Um, I noticed you dropped depreciation off. Uh, I assume we have a calculation for that. Yeah. You know it, how much it should be. Uh, that's why we've been in the hole the last three years. Right. And in the last three years, you can see that it's just about $3.1 So we're anticipating about the same. Yeah, we haven't had a year um, that we've ever covered uh, the full cost of depreciation. Um, we have covered a portion of it thereof, but usually we do end up falling, as you know, about $2 million shy of hitting our total depreciation costs. Yeah. yeah, I guess my recommendation is that we show that eventually we do. Uh, we're showing it uh, zero now because we're saying we're not making money on the water and sewer. And that's, I understand that part of it, but our own bookkeeping for the board, we need to know that we're not covering the full cost that we should be recovering, so. That's one question. I, I think you perhaps answered it. Um, well, there's two other questions. One, you've transferred to debt service is that uh, in three different places? Mm -hmm. Is that the difference between the 498 and the 970? Correct. Yeah, their debt service payment for those specific debt issues are have increased for the next fiscal year. Yeah, they're, they're all the same, but they're mm -hmm. three pieces. So. Right, water, sewer, and probably utility expansion. One's administration, and the other is whatever. Okay. Now the other question I've got is uh, the capital charge, which we've had the discussion of. I'm not quite sure. I know what's reflected in the change. It doesn't look like it's the uh, 50 cent change. It looks like it's a little bit more than that. Um, what is the basis that takes us down to the 1,170,000 1, on the capital charge? That's reflecting a 50 cent de decrease in the capital charge for next fiscal year. 
Hey, let me register an opinion on it. I suggest we either keep it at the eight dollars, or take it down to seven dollars. Uh, Six dollars to an average household is not significant. I hate to answer. Oh, well, we really did you a favor. We took saved you six dollars. Ten dollars maybe a little bit better, but you know. And then you count it. Uh, we have eight dollars and take it down fifty cents. That's sixteen more years of the capital charge. And I'd rather not have that argument. I'd rather say we need the cap, leave, need to leave it where it is because we have a purpose for it. Uh, this is not a new comment. I've, I've made it before, but I st seeing it's reflected here, I just soon have us do one or the other. Personally, that's where I would go. And uh, if we're not covering the depreciation, I'll leave it at the eight until such time as we can make a significant reduction in it. Uh, I don't know if the rest of the board agrees with that or not, but. I'd like to see it <coughs> reduced to 50 cents in the next year, possibly reduce it again and thereafter. So at one point, we can uh, dismiss the whole charge. So uh, it's, it's unusual It's unusual for a government to give back or cut down it once they got it. So that's why it was, I think, suggested, and I was all for that. And if it can be done incrementally, I believe that's the way we should do it. Psychological. No, that was uh, that is something that uh, the mayor has been very strong on asking staff to do as well is to get this uh, charge off the bill as quickly as we can. Um, as you can see, the the there's the other side of it too, which is we uh, we also have some very large water users and and that do a wonderful job offsetting a large portion of our costs. Uh, we we need to remain competitive on both ends of the of the spectrum with regard to what we charge, um, and so we're, we're, it is a bit of a balancing act. But we do have the um, we do have the direct understanding of the board that uh, and, and especially the mayor that would like to see us get that off of the bill. And uh, to that end, that's what we'd like to do. What is the I'm sorry. What's the current schedule for that to expire? Right now, we're going into year two of a three-year ordinance with the village uh, with the uh, rates. Uh, so this year's rates are set by uh, ordinance, and next year's rates are also set by ordinance. So we'll have a chance to revisit it again uh, in well, it'll be two years that we will revisit the the rates structure, and that'll give us a little bit more time to see what's happening uh, with regard to our um, our uh, construction. Um, uh, efforts as well each uh, part of the issue is and why, why how it came this how this came about is that we had largely used the um, water and sewer impact fees that we charge for each new construction to cover the costs of uh, the capital improvements that were made at the uh, wastewater treatment plant and also made at the uh, Lake Michigan water uh, pumping station and while the economy was booming we were very well able to cover those uh, 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 capital costs, um, the, the the bond costs and the like. Uh, with the downturn in the economy, we can't cover those costs. So we implemented a, a flat rate uh, charge uh, that helps satisfy some of the concerns of the uh, bonding rating agencies that we have a guaranteed stable minimum that will be coming in that can help to offset those capital, uh, that can be used to pay those capital charge uh, bond costs. Um, and uh, and that uh, actually helped us to improve our bond rating. Um, the understanding of the board and the, the direction of the board is let's get rid of that though as quickly as we can. So as we're seeing an increase in that commercial activity, as we're seeing an increase in water and s sales and the like, it does help us to be able to offset those numbers. Uh, when we set the rate uh, a year and a half ago, um, you know, we are seeing a slight uptick in uh, building starts. We uh, aren't comfortable enough to fully release uh, all of that those funds from a, uh, just you know the conservative nature of yours truly. And uh, uh, you know, and uh, I'll throw Mrs. Pluckham in on that one too. It's uh, uh, but it is something that we do want to see come off the books. Uh, I'm sorry. So, so worst case. When the debt service is paid off, that goes away, and how long for the debt service? 
Well, and I would also submit um, to Trustee Lamb's point, we do not cover depreciation from year to year. We do have a slight reserve for future improvements for capital extensions and replenishments for water and sewer extensions that, are, that need to be repaired. Um, so I think there's a good t opportunity for the board to discuss the need for such a capital fund um, because regardless of water being dropped through the line, there's still a maintenance issue within the pipes itself. So is the logic to continue with a capital type charge to continue to fund some sort of future uh, infrastructure improvements or is it through a rate discussion and we look at the water and sewer rates differently for that purpose as well. Um, for the ordinance that we have in place, the capital charge will reduce to 750 this coming year and then it will remain the same in fiscal 17 that, or in year 17, that's what's being proposed. Sewer, uh, the sewer rate will remain the same for the next two years as well. It hasn't been increased for a number of years. I don't have the history behind me. And then the water rate will go up slightly again next year. So when we revisit those rates, we can talk about that as well. All right, so how long is our bond? Oh, the bonds themselves uh, for the water and sewer fund, um, I, I'd have to get that schedule for you. I don't have it handy, but well, I'll. The last one that was issued was 2008, and so. But when does it, ex when's the last payment on it? So that would be 20. 20 years out. Yeah, 20, 20 years out. Thank you. A couple additional comments. Uh, one, have some professional background, if you will, in my DuPont career with voice treatment and also the engineering things. And I'm continually amazed at what you all do to provide water and sewer services with so few people and have so few complaints. It's incredible. I don't think we realize how lucky we are. It's not easy to do that, and so your organization needs to take a lot of credit for that. Uh, one thing on the uh, IDNR, it doesn't happen to show Bolingbrook. Bolingbrook uses Lake Michigan water, don't they? Yeah, their, their rate would be directly through Illinois American Water since um, the American Lake Water Company, which is American Water, owns the lake water pipeline. Illinois American owns all of the water mains, water towers, water meters, everything within Bolingbrook. So it would fall under Illinois American and not quote unquote Bolingbrook. Um, Except they don't list them there. And they list a whole bunch of them, but Bolingbrook's not one of them. I'm just curious to what they're paying because they were very unhappy, and I, I assume it's a very high rate, but I don't see any documentation of that. Uh, they're still paying about 30% more than we are. All right, thank you. I, I guess I would agree with Mr. Lamb. I, I think, you know, water is one of those things I think people just take, take for granted. You turn your spigot on, and, you know, you expect it to be drinkable. So. I think one of the positive decisions that the village made over the years was to switch to Lake Michigan water. And obviously now there's a little bit of cost involved in that, but I think long term to have that quality and ba basically almost you know consistent source of water is a huge. Because I know there's going to be other communities around that are still trying to work through the, the deep wells and all those other issues. So, And then the other piece that I would just make to comment on is the, and maybe you can help me un uh, express this properly. So. We're using some of the some of the taxes that we receive from the village to help offset the cost of the of the department. So, and I think if you look at it, it's almost basically what the capital charge is, or even a little bit more than that. So, while there is a capital charge on the bill, we are utilizing other funds to help offset what could be even a larger bill for our for our residents. You stated that very well, sir. Oh, thank you. For a non-accountant. Huh? <laughs> uh, the other thing uh, is uh, to that end, um, the the village, yeah, it was 2003 when the village made the decision to go to American uh, to, to Lake Michigan Water, um, and as well, um, they were very smart in um, making the capital improvements that they did make at the wastewater treatment plant and at the uh, Lake Michigan pumping station. Uh, the uh, there are a lot of a lot of towns that. Um, uh, have to discourage development and have to discourage investment in their community because they don't have the uh, wastewater and water services for their uh, uh, for their community to be able to take on new growth. You know, we are very well positioned in, in that particular regard. Uh, as you know, uh, Diageo did a did, did an expansion a few years ago, and part of the reason why they took a look at making that investment in Plainfield is they knew we had the capacity. They knew that our wastewater treatment plant could handle the additional load that they were going to be sending to us, 
and it was a very easy decision for them to uh, to invest in our community. So that's just one example of many where that uh, earlier decision ha is paying off quite well as we look for new growth. Um, it, it's unfortunate that we have to have that capital charge, uh, but it, we still are very well positioned for growth as a result of it. And just for discussion too, <coughs> one of our neighboring towns is uh, contemplating picking up Lake Michigan water and I believe they're 25 million dollars to 26 million dollars just on invitation so it's uh, it's well worth us uh, that they went to it back when uh, compared to the cost now so when I think and I think the other the little pieces that people might not realize you know that maybe we're here or weren't you know you talk about softer water but that you know I had a water softener in my home at one point before we switched to you know, so I don't have that cost of salt. I don't have the upgrade of that system. The clothes are better. You know, there's a lot of positives associated with the Lake Michigan water that, you know, you, sometimes we can take for granted because it is such a quality product. Uh, Trustee Lamin O'Rourke has some very good points on the rates, and I do believe that we have to be prepared to handle any um, infrastructure issues that we have with getting water to our residents, um, as well as I do agree with uh, the idea of eliminating <laughs> as many charges off individuals tax bills as possible but I think for the time being um, with uh, trustee lambs comments I would uh, go ahead with the rate that he recommended okay if there aren't any other comments uh, one quick comment just for some information for some of the people I'm not sure everybody's aware of the contract we have that runs to 2037 and it's a very good contract. We pay a very nominal amount for maintenance and so on. And so the deal that we have has a long time to run, and we're very fortunate that deal was struck. Uh, I think you all negotiated that. But very, very favorable to us, and part of the reason our neighboring towns are very unhappy with us. We have something they want they're not going to get. So it, uh, it has a, I know this is a long term, it has a 10 year renewable continual 10-year renewable terms too as well so the board at the time if they're happy with the contract they can renew it for another 10 years and then another 10 years and and it's a, it's a good relationship I agree so if there's no other questions the board you'll see all of this documentation back staff plans I'm bringing back the full budget probably either late January or sometime in February one of those workshops um, one of the reasons why we might delay a little bit is because of the state and where they're at with their budget hopefully we'll get some further information as to the revenue side of things with the state if not um, we do have a little bit of tweaks here and there based on the input from the board so far so um, we will bring this back at a future workshop and there'll be ample opportunity to have additional comments and any other questions that you might have the budget will need to be approved before May 1st so there's plenty of time to work through some of these uh, questions and get a little more details out of the way if there is anything coming forward you know mayor Collins are you with us okay <laughs> I just one final comment if you don't mind uh, you know what I just like to say to the staff and the this certainly wasn't a waste of time and the, the report was not watered down in the least and it was really <laughs> well thought out. <laughs> he told me to say that. <laughs> Murphy told me to say that. I was totally innocent. Bye. Thank you. Thank you very much for your comments. Thank you. And it wasn't wastewater. <laughs> Reminders. Uh, the Planning Commission is on the 15th at 7 p.m. Uh, 21st will be our next village board meeting. Our offices will be closed on the 24th and 25th, and the next committee of the whole has been canceled as of this point. Speaking a motion to adjourn. Motion to adjourn. Second. Motion's been made and seconded to adjourn. All in favor? Aye. Aye. All opposed? Thank you. That motion carries.